were going door to door through the neighborhood and finally arrived at Mrs. Smith's house. She was not happy to see them. She greeted them with an attitude that made it clear she had no time to waste on them or on their message. As she slammed the door in their faces though, to her surprise it bounced back open. So she caught it, slammed it again, but the same thing happened again. Convinced the man must be sticking his foot in the doorway, she reared back to slam it hard enough to teach him a lesson, and he cried out, Ma'am, before you do that, you better move your cat. <laughs> Poor cat. <laughs> I think after the first slam, the cat would move himself, wouldn't you think? The cat would get out of there. Revelation 13, 19 and 22, or those whom I love I rebuke, and discipline so be earnest and repent here I am I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with that person and they with me would you bow your heads with me dear Lord we are grateful that we have you as our Lord and Savior because there is no other we're grateful that you gave us your word to an and trusted it to us, Lord, to, to live on it and to share it. And as we look into these morsels this morning, we pray that you guide and direct the word to where you want it to go, and it will cause what you want it to cause, in Jesus' name, amen. Talking about doors and doorways and entryways this morning, life is full of doorways. There are places where we should enter, and there are places where we should not enter. And there are places where we should exit. See the sign? That's where you can get out of here if you need to. A door is a barrier, the door itself. It keeps the rain out. It keeps the wind and the cold out. It keeps the heat in. A doorway is a, is a way into a building, a room or a situation. A doorway can be a way into a situation. Picture your house without doors. You wouldn't live in a house without doors. In summer, the bugs and the flies would come in. In the winter, the cold would come in. Bad people might come in. A door provides privacy. We had a, an apartment for a while in Peoria, Illinois, um, the bathroom had no door on it. <laughs> there was no door on the bathroom. It was upstairs over the studio that I was working for, and he, he, he let us stay up there until we bought a house. We were in the market for a house. So, so the boss, he said, I have an apartment that's empty up there, but there was no door on the bathroom. <laughs> Strange. But we just had two little, little kids. We didn't have our third one yet. So anyway, we got through. But a door provides privacy. Objects or activities can be hidden behind closed doors. Eve opened a door when she listened to the serpent. The door was shut uh, before she opened it. And the door was that she knew what God had said about the fruit of that tree. He said, don't. He said, do not. And she knew that, so that was the door. And she opened it. She shouldn't have opened it. When God tells us not to do a thing, we should stay away from it, not get near it. Far away if possible not only don't do it but stay away from it there weren't many directives um, for Adam and Eve they could have anything they wanted they had all the food they wanted they had perfect tells there was only one forbidden fruit just one thing and Eve should have stayed away from that tree Adam was right there too they had the whole garden Life was good and satisfying. 
in Genesis 4, chapter 7, this is a little bit later, it says, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That was spoken by God to Cain before he killed his brother. Sin is crouching at your door. You must rule over it, but Cain did not rule over it. He did not listen to God. Cain started with anger, sort of a jealous, envious anger, but his anger was unresolved. He didn't rule over it as God told him to. Sin is crouching at your door, and he became a murderer. So some doorways are places where sin crouches, where temptation calls. Keep that one closed, amen? Keep it closed. Sin was crouching there. David opened a real bad door, a sin door. Sin was crouching at that door too. David had a good life. He had experienced many victories military victories he was the king he had armies he knew god god had been with him in many battles starting with goliath actually starting when he was a shepherd boy and he killed a lion and a bear but at this time he sent his armies out to battle but he stayed home stay in the battle stay in the battle we're in a war, battle after battle. The prize is your soul. Your enemy never rests. Your enemy crouches at the door. David knew better. Uriah was his friend. Uriah was one of David's 30 elite soldiers. They called him the 30. He was one of that group. It was like their SEAL Team 6. It was like the palace guard. So I'm convinced, really, that Bathsheba was complicit in this event, in the affair. Why would she bathe where King David would be able to see her? Why would she do that? He, they were friends. She knew where his palace was and where his windows were. Why would she do that? Would, would she do that if Uriah was at home? I don't think so. So why did she bathe right there when Uriah was off to the war and David stayed home, stayed behind? He didn't, he wasn't in the battle. But she was opening a sin door too. They both were. And no good came of it. Uriah was killed. The baby died. The Lord took him. And Joab com became complicit in murder. Samson opened a sin door. He wasn't supposed to be messing around with Philistine women. They weren't supposed to do that. You don't even go near the sin door. This was in Judges chapter 16. One day Samson went to Gaza. Gaza! Gaza, the place that's in the news. That's where he went where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. Remember, he was a Nazarite. There was a vow. He wasn't supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. In verse number two, the people of Gaza were told, Samson's here. He was the judge of Israel. That was before the kings. He was the judge of Israel. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with its two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the Valley of Sorek. I don't know if that was in Gaza, probably not. The Valley of Sorek. And her name was Delilah. You know all about Delilah. 
the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength or how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. She wasn't in love with him. She was in love with the idea that she could have, I don't know how many rulers there were, but each one of them were going to give her 1,100 shekels of silver. She would be rich. That was what she was in love with. She would do anything to him. She didn't care about him. So you know what happened? Don't go near the sin door, Samson. Don't look into it. Don't fall in love with a Philistine woman. They were commanded not to be doing stuff like that. Stay away. Stay holy. Without holiness, no one will see God. Well, there's other kinds of doors in life. The doorway of salvation. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. That's a narrow doorway that leads to the road to salvation. The few who find that narrow gate must make an important decision, the most profound move toward God that can never happen. You're just walking along, enjoying your sinful life, and the Holy Spirit draws you toward God. You've all been there, haven't you? <laughs> There's nobody in here that hasn't had this experience. Someone talks to you, or you go to church to hear the gospel somewhere, and you, or maybe you read a, a Bible that was left in a motel room by a Gideon, and you hear the gospel, and you give in to the Holy Spirit, and you accept Jesus as your Savior. And live for God instead of living for yourself. It's a true miracle when that happens. And only a few find it. You are a precious few. Then you become a soul-winning gospel carrier. All because you turned off of the broad way onto the narrow way, onto the narrow path. You had to go through a gate or a doorway. You turned away from your own way and on to God's way. We're talking about doorways today. The way that leads to eternal life. Then there are doors of blessing. God opens doors in life. Some are opportunities to bless someone. An example would be the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He passed by an opportunity to be a blessing to this poor guy that was in the same they were both Jewish people so too a Levite when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side why would they do that they didn't want to get involved but a Samaritan which the Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other back then as he traveled came where the man was when he saw him, he took pity on him. There's an open door of compassion, taking pity on somebody that's having a hard time. The next day, he took out two denarii. Oh, I, I skipped part of it. He, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The good Samaritan had to go out of his comfort zone. 
he had, instead of staying on the other side of the road and I don't want to touch that guy or get anywhere near him, he had to go over there and get involved, personally, up close, physically involved. That's an open door. The man's affliction beckoned to him without even saying anything. Saw him laying there and went. It was unusual for a Samaritan to associate with Jews and vice versa, but the good-hearted Samaritan rose above the social barrier and saved this Hebrew whom he didn't even know. He didn't have to do that. It would have been acceptable socially for him to pass by and not get involved. He crossed a social barrier. The opportunity to help was a doorway. Carol and I have had opportunity to pray for people in the store. I have more opportunities to do that because usually I'm there by myself, but she was with me a couple of times. We walk up to somebody that's having some kind of hurt. We just ask them, can I pray with you? Only one person ever said no. No, two. There have been two over the years. So going there and doing things like that, and like the Samaritan, is outside of your comfort zone. Do it anyway. Go through that door. Be a blessing. Amen? Enter the doorway of helping someone. It was interesting. We were... last. Was it last Sunday we, we canceled? Last Sunday? I canceled on the way up here. So the squall I was in the middle of, we went back home, and I said, well... Let's go over to the to the home church there at Pine Cross. So we went over there, and uh, they didn't start till 11, so we were okay. We made it in there. So we went to that church, and after church, we went to the Dream restaurant. You know the Dream, Dave's Dream, down in, down in, down there in Hollingsburg. That's her favorite. She likes the pork chops, stuffed pork chops. On that's their special on Sunday. So that's where we went. And then we sat there, and there was a, a couple that came in. And it was a, a black man, tall black man, well-dressed, and a, and a blonde lady. And they were sitting, like, over there. So after, after we ate and the, and, the, and the waitress brought the check, I said, you're going to have to add to my bill. We, I always get a couple of cream puffs and a couple of eclairs and take home. So I asked her to pack up two, two eclairs and two cream puffs. And I said, and then pack up one eclair and one cream puff and give it to those people right there that was out of my comfort zone I like tearing that dome down I like I just like getting out of that comfort zone so she did and they waved at me and said thank you and I walked over and told them I said these you know these people make really good eclairs and cream puffs which they do I can only eat half of one we divide them up so I went over there and I said to the man I said I just kind of felt like he was a minister I said are you a pastor he says I am I said, me too. He said, where do you pastor? I said, an independent Pentecostal church. He's a Pentecostal pastor also. Church of God in Christ, which is our sort of cousin. That's the black Pentecostal denomination. We talked a little bit, and I knew right where their church was. Mother Gethsemane Church of God in Christ on 6th Avenue. I knew right where that was. So I met this pastor. And it was a blessing to me to do that. But I had to go through that doorway a comfort zone I could have just ignored them and left but I just like doing stuff like that there's some some are times when God wants to bless you I went through an open door when I married this woman she opened her door I opened my door we both opened the door of our lives to each other together the married life is vastly different from the single life, I'm sure you can all agree with that. I don't hear any amens, but <laughs> it sure is. Vastly different. Your life isn't the same anymore after you go through the doorway of marriage. We're talking about doorways today. You open your life to her. She opens her life to you. You merge and have a life together. Most decisions that you make are made for the good of the unit now you have a partner 
You're not just you anymore. You're part of a us. And making a living, where are you going to live, acquiring a home, raising children. Those are all things God wants to open to you. Of course, you've already been there, so I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. I don't have, I didn't, I wasn't going to tell this, but when when we were living in New England, um, she started having babies and her, our income was cut in half because she, she couldn't, she quit working. She was a highly skilled legal secretary and she made almost as much as I did. So our income was cut in half. We had to move into a, and we lived in an apartment complex, real nice sort of new buildings. We, have to, we had to move out of there. We couldn't pay the rent anymore. So we lived in a top half of a house like a two-family house, top half, in Plainville, Connecticut, but we couldn't even afford that. And that's when we got saved and learned about tithing. And no matter how hard it got, we still paid our tithes. And sometimes I didn't know where the next, honestly, the next bottle of milk was coming from for the babies. And I'd find a few bucks in a drawer or something. And God, God sustained us. With what was, but we always paid our tithes, always, always. It was so important to us. And God made a way for us to go to Peoria where I had a job offer and I could actually make a living twice as much as I was making. So that was an open door that God opened to us. And when we went out there, the boss told me later, because I was carrying a Bible, he says, when I saw you carrying that Bible, I knew you were the man for me. He had a heart like that. And uh, so he wanted, wanted me to work for him. And, and uh, my friend, that, my friend that, that, worked, that was working there, he called up a realtor, a Christian realtor, because the boss said, I want you to live in a house. He says, I want you to put down roots. I don't want you living in apartments. I said, Jim, I had to borrow, you had to prepay the ticket for me to fly out here. We don't have any money, none. He says, I'll advance you the down payment. Sight unseen. I never knew this guy before. I'll advance you the down payment. He advanced me $1,000 and took I don't know what it was, 20 bucks a week or something out of, the, out of our check until it was paid. God opens doors of blessing. It was amazing. So we had a house. I went back home. I flew back home. He paid for the round trip ticket because I didn't have any money. And I told her, I said, I was driving around the Christian realtor. She says, we can't have a house. We don't have any money. We didn't think we'd ever have a house. I said, yeah, he's, the boss is going to advance us the down payment. God is good. He's good. There's no physical door, physical door, made of steel or wood, that can keep God out. Talking about doorways today, you know, the disciples in the upper room were behind closed doors. And when they went on the road to Emmaus, Jesus came and started walking with those two disciples. And when they went back, they started talking about that they had encountered Jesus on the road. And while they were still talking about this, Luke chapter 24, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. Jesus did not need them to open the door. He just appeared in there, right through the wall, right through the door. The Holy Spirit didn't need them to open in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. They came in there with the sound of a rushing wind with what looked like tongues of fire that separated and came on to them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The door was closed. God doesn't, there's no physical door or barrier that can, can keep God out. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, they opened the door, then it went out to minister. And Peter preached his first sermon and 3,000 people came to Christ as Lord and Savior. No physical barrier can keep 
the Lord out. He's omnipresent, but God respects your heart. You have to open that door. God will not overrule your right to keep the door of your heart closed to him. He can come through any door he wants to, but he won't overrule your right to keep your door closed to him. Revelation 3.20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The sinner has to open the door. Wish there were some sinners here today. I could make a nice altar call out of this. But the sinner has to open the door. God doesn't knock the door down. He could, but he expects your right to remain in your sins. Not only that, but God respects your right to refuse to go through a doorway that he opens for you to be a blessing for someone else. And he does that. He opens doors for you to be potentially a blessing and you might put up a barrier. No, I don't want to do that. He respects that. He doesn't force his way. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Imagine that there is one place where God's will may not prevail. And that's in your heart. The sinner has to open the door. That's why all the angels in heaven rejoice over each sinner who repents. But the believer has to open the door too when God gives us opportunity, when God presents doorways of, to help someone or to do something or to pray for someone. It's out of our comfort zone to open that door, but we have to do it. He doesn't make us do it. We just need to do it. We just should do it. Luke 15, 10, In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. When a sinner comes to Christ, that is a miracle, a real miracle. It's the most important door, doorway that anyone will ever enter is the doorway to salvation. Amen? Talk, talking about doorways today. The church is a doorway. In 2022, six people came to Christ through the ministry of this church. That's the most important thing that we do. In 2023, five people came to Christ here. God is good. I don't know what doorways we'll experience in 2024, but at least on my part, we will go through them. I believe people will come here. Sinners. People that are hurting in some way. And this church needs to be a place, a sanctuary, and a place of healing and blessing. We will go through carrying the gospel. Bringing the good news that there's a God in heaven and there's a Savior who suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins. We will go through the door with, with a message that there is forgiveness for the sinner who repents. We will go through the doorway with a message that there is healing in Jesus. This, the church has a door. And the church is a door to those who are on the outside, who are on that broad path that leads to destruction. And you are a door. Is your door open? This is from a site in, on, online called Bible Reasons. When God opens doors in our lives, don't try to close it because of the trials, which is sometimes required. No one can close an open door that God has for you. So have confidence in the Lord. If God opens a door, you can't close it. You can go around it. You can refuse to enter. But you can't close it. If it's God's will, it'll be done. Remember, he always has a plan. Watch out as well for doors that God closes. 
Some doors are not God's will for you to enter them. And God closes it for your protection. God knows everything. And he knows if you're on a path that leads to danger. Pray to God continuously to know his will. Rely on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will tell you if something is God's will. Allow the Spirit to guide your life. When God opens a door, he will never cause you to compromise or contradict his word. Many times God will confirm his word, his will through his word, um, and through others, such as godly counsel. Usually you know it's an open door from God when you have to rely on him. Some people try to do things in the arm of the flesh, but when it's God's will, we must ask him to bless the work of our hands. We must ask him to strengthen us and help us daily. If God doesn't make a way, there will be no way. Seek first God's kingdom. Open doors will strengthen your prayer, uh, your prayer life and your faith. When it's an open door, you know that it is God who is really at work. Once again, remember that the Holy Spirit will give you an uneasy feeling if he wants you to keep a door closed or not go into it. Then as the uneasy feeling is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Keep on knocking on God's door. Sometimes the door is a little cracked open and God just wants us to persevere in prayer. When the time is right, he will fully open the door. So life is full of possibilities, pathways, doorways. Some are invitations to come in and be blessed. Some are invitations to be a blessing to someone. Some are traps of the enemy. These are the enticements to sin. We need to be careful. We need to be vigilant. We need to be aware of doorways. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Opportunities are doorways. If we stay in God's will, we will go through right doorways. And the last doorway is heaven's gate. One beautiful day, one sweet, holy, happy day. Step up to the shoreline of eternity and we'll be allowed to drop this robe of flesh with all of its pain and all of its limitations and just lift off into eternity and go to Jesus at the gate. We get to move in with God in a place that Jesus is getting ready. How blessed it will that be? How awesome will that be? How beautiful will that be? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Meanwhile, we're going to keep doing what he wants us to do. Go through the doors he opens and stay away from doors that we shouldn't be in. Amen. There's examples in the Bible for us of people who did things both ways. And I think we're mature enough believers today to know the difference, right? We are. I wish there were a few sinners here today to preach this to. <laughs> but I'm preaching to the choir. So, but that's all right. Would you stand? I'm out of words now. <laughs> Done talking now. Scotty, would you pray a dismissal for us? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, we just pray a blessing on each one here. Guide us to our respective homes and bring us back to the appointed time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Board meeting.